It's time for the one and only, the premier, the only official podcast of Pro Rodeo. Your suit bosses are ready, so let's give it a go and talk some rodeo. Welcome back into another exciting episode of The Shoot Bosses. It's Tanner Barth. It's Tracy Rink, as we always are, bringing you another great episode as the 2024 Pro Rodeo season rolls on. Tracy, uh, you know, we're starting to get into into April now. You know, things are starting to heat up, I guess you could say. We're kind of wrapping up some of those Texas winter rodeos and turning our focus more to the springtime. Yeah, I mean, the Texas winter rodeos are huge. I mean, the payouts were amazing and they're not really done, so to speak. I mean, yeah. they are, but then they roll into the spring of San Angelo, a big rodeo coming up. And it just, it's crazy to me. I mean, you've been doing this a little while. I've been doing it a little longer, but how fast these seasons go. Yeah. It's like, it seems like it's January 1st. We're back from the NFR. And then all of a sudden it's like, here we go rolling again. It's, it's like, May, yeah, it's June, already May, yeah. June. And then once Reno hits, it's like nonstop. But yeah, it's, it's an exciting time. The one thing that caught my eye is like, Damian Brennan has like $116,000. Chad Mayfield has $107,000. And we're not even to April 1st yet. Like, that's insane. It's not an April Fool's joke either. No, no, it's not. (laughs) Tracy already touched on it a little bit, but uh, one of those big reasons those Cowboys do have that number is going to lead us right into our pro rodeo props, and we're going to give a props to all the uh, the winter rodeos out there that make this, uh, you know, pro rodeo season possible, Tracy, all the way from January until you said, you know, maybe this San Angelo time or, you know, I guess we're probably into spring for most of these rodeos but you know maybe ending with that houston Houston. rodeo Mm -hmm. but that winter run is just so important to what the pro rodeo season is and to to what pro rodeo is right and and to win world championships yeah i mean it doesn't guarantee world championships the thing it guarantees if you win houston is more than likely outside of injury is you go to the nfr yeah that's why that rodeo is so big i mean sure everybody wants to win fifty thousand, but if you win 50 you're actually winning 60 because you're going to get the per diem to go to the nfr (laughs) automatically and granted use it for tickets but then you're in the nfr and then you have the shot so and we got to experience the houston rodeo for the first time and what a spectacle the the biggest thing that i took from there is i mean it's a huge arena but the seventy thousand fans you just don't Mm -hmm. see that at rodeos i mean we've been to the american in the past and it had like 20 some it wasn't set up the way rodeo houston is and i mean thomas and mac is you know eighteen thousand strong sold out but seventy thousand is just a different environment and you could just feel the energy at that place it was crazy yeah it was it was quite the spectacle so as tracy said for our proteo props i'm going to give a shout out to all those winter rodeos you know denver fort worth san antonio houston san angelo tucson austin, yeah austin. austin's you know so many great rodeos in there that that make this run possible and you know the fans the contestant money that's up for grabs so that's your pro rodeo props here on the shoot bosses. Let's transition into our next segment. And that's the short round tracing. We're going to start it off with, uh, you know, one of the greatest uh, that we've seen, you know, probably top 10, you know, historically in the Saddle Bronx side of things. Powder River Rodeo's Miss Congeniality, two-time horse of the year, 11 trips to the NFR, passed away just last week. Yeah, and that, that was a great horse. It, it, it was, was just so solid. I mean, what you... When they say honest, I mean, every time guys got on that horse, they knew they were going to get. And Rod Hay won a couple rounds on that horse. And so many people placed on that horse. And when you draw that horse at the NFR, that's the kind of horse you want to draw because you know if you do your job and the horse does its job, you're going to win a check. You might not win the round, but you win a check. And it's sad to see a horse like that go, but the horse lived, I believe, till 26. Yeah. And I mean, it lived, they took it down to. Canyon, Texas. They had some breeding. They were doing some breeding stuff down there for the last several years of its life. But it's just, it's crazy. And, and what Lori Franzen had told me, they're just family members. I mean, mm-hmm. I have pets that are dogs that, I mean, I cherish. Yeah. You imagine having a it's horse your that, that lives till <laughs> it's 26. I mean, yeah. it's crazy. I mean, it's part of your family. And and not only have they accomplished a lot, it's just, it would be heartbreaking in a sense, but they've done so much for you. And, and they've got, you know, they, they're going to move on from that horse and have things to follow in its foot, footsteps, but w- just a great horse. Yeah, no doubt about it. Miss Congeniality, they're 26 years old, Powder River Rodeos. Also on our short round list, uh, you know, hate to bring more bad news up, Tracy, but found out bad news earlier this week, the 2023 Resist All Rookie of the Year bull rider T. Parker going to miss, uh, you know, a significant amount of time. I guess it would technically be the remainder of the 2024 season, but he did give out hope that he could be back towards the tail end, but, you know, puts the NFR out of out of picture for T. Parker. Yeah, I mean, he's got rotator cuff issues and labrum issues, and he had this rise up at the NFR last year. He missed a couple Well before, rounds. yeah, Ellensburg. Yeah. Well, in Ellensburg, excuse me, and you could tell it was bothering him at the NFR. He sent out a couple rounds. He had the doctor mm-hmm. release out, and it just, 
it comes to the point, it's kind of like Kai Hamilton. You get hurt, and at some point you got to get it fixed because you keep fighting that fight. It, it's going to be a, an unwinnable fight at some time. And, and sometimes you're not only going to miss this, you're going to miss maybe a year and a half just trying to get well. And hopefully he's young enough. You know, mm -hmm. he's super young, rookie of the year, very talented. And he, I think he's doing the right thing. I mean, get get healthy. I mean, he had a great season so far. He won almost forty grand. That's he was probably eighteenth in the world. That's yeah. probably what disappointed him the most. It's one thing if you're having a terrible season and you've been injured, and you're saying, "Okay, I'm just going to shelve it and get get surgery." But I mean, ideally, if things were keep going the way they were, he would have made the NFR again. And I mean, it's unfortunate. It's just bull riding. I mean, yeah. He, he, even it when happens. he talked, even when he talked to you about it and me, he's like, "Oh yeah, well, the, the time I hurt my shoulder in Ellsberg, it's because I was fighting broken ribs. It's like, mm -hmm. it's like being a gunfighter." Yeah. <laughs> There's always injuries. It's always something. So it's unfortunate, but he's young enough. I know he'll recover. Yeah, T. Parker mentioned to us that, uh, you know, he came out one Denver right after the 1st of uh, January and then finished second at Fort Worth and then just kind of got to a point where he couldn't really ride anymore. I think he uh, said he went down to Florida and he couldn't even hold on with his bull rope. You know, it was at a point where he couldn't stay up with his bull rope and he ultimately made the tough decision to to call it a, you know, a season. It's going to be a six-month recovery. He'll sit down and talk with Dr. Tanny Freeman and they'll do his surgery. That'll be on April 10th and then that's six months and then he hopes he can come back but if not you know all focus on 2025 and at only 20 years old you know he's still got he's still got a lot of rodeo left to go he told me he hopes to be riding until his 30s so hopefully this will you know kind of put that behind him a little bit and age is on his side like oh, you yeah. said age is on his side when you're 30 when you're 30 and get hurt like that it, it becomes an eight month injury probably mm -hmm. when you're 20 and you're still rejuvenated and healthy like that he'll recover the thing that's crazy is like, so Stetson's been out. For so you look, a Kyle. fit, a fit of the field. Oh, fit. The I, I was going to say, at the top of my head, I thought a third. Yeah. But it's been him. Stetson, Kai, now T. Yeah, so that's, yeah. That's, that's, that's oh, a fifth. That's a fifth. I'm yeah. sorry. I was thinking 12. Well, math wasn't my, math was, Buck, Buck helped me with math. So yeah, I can that's tell. things all you want. But so that's crazy. So you've taken yeah. three guys. I mean, Stetson and Kai, I think one of those two will get in just because of ground money. But it's crazy. When one door closes, opportunity opens for other guys. So if this this is your chance, you want to be a bull rider at the NFR, you got to take the bull by the horn, so to speak, and yeah, capitalize. No doubt about it. So we wish T. Parker the best, his recovery. I'm sure he'll have lots of stuff on his social media. You can kind of follow along with how he how he's doing there in his recovery. Get ready for our eight question segment, Tracy. And this is going to be a guy who has, hasn't been to the NFR, but he's on a steady climb in his career. We're going to sit down with 25-year-old uh, steel wrestler Kyler Dick. And Kyler's one of those guys that, you know, he just seems to be getting closer and closer. He was outside the top 52 years ago. Last year, he gets all the way up to, I believe it was 25th in the world standings. And now he's just, you know, kind of steadily progressing his way to hopefully get to Vegas one of these days. It's, it's a grind. And once you get that good horse and you start, you start traveling with guys that are champions or NFR guys, I mean, iron sharpens iron. I know it's cheesy to say, but then you start realizing, hey, I can do this. I'm with guys that believe I can do it. And then you start believing in yourself. And he's got all the talent in the world. And Hopefully he's got the horsepower and he stays healthy. And I mean, you just never know who's going to pop up at the NFR. Every year is different, and there's a lot of things involved. But great guy, great to talk with him, and uh, hopefully people get some insight with this. Yeah, we sat down with him at Rodeo Houston. Here's your eight question segment with Kyler Dick. Favorite rodeo? Pendleton. Uh, favorite horse you've owned? Uh, Roquefort. Favorite restaurant? Papados. Favorite movie? Tombstone. Favorite wrestling hold? Uh, basket cradle. How many high school st state championships did you win in wrestling? Zero. <laughs> Describe uh, what winning means to you. Uh, winning to me just proves that all the hard work and dedication that I put into the sport is paying off for myself and for my family. Make of your first car? It was a Dodge, O2 Dodge. And Tracy, it was great to catch up with Kyler. We caught him kind of hanging out in the hospitality room there at Rodeo Houston, a relaxed environment. You could tell he had a little bit of fun with it as well. Yeah, I think he was shocked when I first started talking to him because at times those guys think I'm interviewing him and I'm just trying to be candid and he was great about it. And I know I asked him some wrestling questions if I'm remembering right. Because <laughs> like, uh, yeah. all these guys are wrestlers and I think I asked him what his favorite hold was and 
I, I'm trying to remember his answer off the top of my head, but we try to have fun with those guys with the eight questions because everybody knows the rodeo cowboys, everybody knows their horsepower, everybody. Mm. So we try to do things off the wall, and he had fun with it, and we appreciate his time. Yeah, no doubt about it. We got much more coming your way on the shoot bosses. Stay with us. We will on the back side of the show sit down and chat, uh, you know, with Ty Harris. Also, going to have your Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame spotlight and so much more. Don't go anywhere on the shoot bosses. Horses are one of nature's greatest gifts, which is why they deserve the very best that nature has to offer. Since we've started using hemp flavor, our horses are calmer, more willing, more athletic. In the daily pellet, they eat it in their feed. My horses are picky. For them to eat it says something. The stuff's really just been lightning in the bottle. Equine Hemp Solutions. We support your horse so you can support your lifestyle. Proud supporter of your Western Sports Association. Go to the Equine Solutions website below and use Cowboy 10 and receive 10% off your order. We're back here, Tanner and Tracy. Another segment coming your way here on The Shoot Boss is the official podcast of Pro Rodeo. we got a great guest coming your way. We'll sit down with Ty Harris. He's coming off a huge win at Rodeo Houston. You know, $50,000. Sadly, he had to beat his brother in a tiebreaker to do it. But can't wait just to ask him about that experience because, you know, one of the most unique experiences a Rodeo Cowboy can have. Yeah, and then they were sharing the same horse, Mo. Yeah, I mean, same that's rope, that's same the stirrups. Same, yeah, like, it's <laughs> literally like... He's driving a race car and then he climbs out and he's in a fire scene. Can you and beat jumps, my time? And he yeah. jumps in and can you beat my time? It was just crazy. It was electric. I mean, it was just so fun and you. I'm sure he's going to be excited to talk about the emotion it meant to his family. Yeah, no doubt about it. But before we get there, we got a bunch more to, to go down the list here and break off with you, Tracy. And we're going to start things off with our Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame Spotlight. One of the best rough stock cowboys of all time that a lot of people uh, you know, talk about. Our spotlight is going to shine right now on 1979 Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame inductee Harry Tompkins. And Tompkins is one of those guys, Tracy, that had a unique career. You know, he won, I think it was, let's see, five bull riding world titles one bareback riding world title, two all-around titles, and those titles were separated by, what was it? Let's see. 21 to 30. Yeah, 21 to 33. 33, yeah. Yeah, it's unheard of, in yeah, the rough stock especially. Right, I, it's just, it tells you what a cowboy is, and all you need to know about Harry Tompkins, when you get inducted in the inaugural class of the Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame, You're doing it, it tells right. you how good you are, because they're going to induct the best of the best in the first class. I mean, that, that's just how it works with any, any Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. And Tompkins was legendary. I mean, a lot of people lose it, lose time of what he did because you know, time passes. It was a while ago, yeah. But he's one of considered one of the best cowboys ever, and and to do that, and like you said, from a twelve year span between final championships and rough stock is incredible. Yeah, I think his first one was in 1948. His last one was in 60 or 62, so it is incredible. And he was one of the first Cowboys that actually took it, you know, under his belt, Tracy, to fly his own plane. He flew yeah. himself. He went to over 75 rodeos a year. And if you think about that, 75 rodeos a year in 1950, yeah. that's impressive, man. Well, I mean, it, that way you, you yeah. could have bad rodeos, because I don't know what the rodeo count yeah, was back then, but obviously there is one now. But, yeah, he could... He could do whatever he wanted and have a chance to qualify, but you know you still have to be a pilot. I mean, yeah. how stressful was that? I know we have guys that are pilots now, but I mean, it's good and bad. Like you're the pilot and you have to get there, but I mean, that's a game changer. It's a complete game changer because you can go to three or four rodeos a week or four rodeos back then mm -hmm. in the fifties when guys travel and maybe get to one. Yeah, one and, every month. Yeah, you know, that time. one every month just because of the way the world was back then, yeah. so it's crazy. It is, so there's your Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame spotlight on Harry Tompkins. Time for our Did You Know segment, Tracy, and uh, I know you probably know this one. We've kind of looked at these a lot over the years, but did you know that the Wild Rogue Pro Rodeo in Central Point, Oregon is the home and the originator of the only 100-point ride in Pro Rodeo history? Crazy. Well, it was Wade Leslie, I believe, or if I'm thinking Yeah, Wade Leslie on yeah. Brownie's Wolfman. Yeah. And there's a plaque downstairs in the Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame that says the only 100 pro ride. I talked to some insiders here at the PRCA back in the day, and they didn't know if it was quite 100, because 100 is, I mean, that's such a special ride. But, I mean, you can't blame the rider. I mean, no. the rider does his job. That They felt like the judges, you know, the stock did his job. And, I mean, that, that ride will always be known forever when everything keeps going, because if there's another 100-point ride, which maybe there is, that'll always be the first one. 
Yeah, and when you look at that, you know, it was in 1991, and I think the only other two highest rides come in bull riding as well before we get down to, you know, bareback and saddle bronc being in the 95s. But, you know, it is interesting to see how that shakes out and uh, and probably a feat that will, you know, if I had to guess never be matched again, it may be, you know, we may get a ride that, yeah, blows the roof off of the building. It would have to be bulls in my opinion. Yeah. Just because, I mean, that's where it's the most electric. I mean, horses are great, but... I and mean, they've been close to that before. You yeah, know, so I mean, it's... Cody Hancock, I know Mr. U- uh, Universe, or Mr. USA, excuse me, had a 96 at the NFR one year on, on Bulls. And it, it, I would think it would have to be Bulls. But, I mean, 95 we've had in you know, mm-hmm. rough stock recently. It's just so much, even a 95 to 100 is like, it's like a pitcher throwing 80 and then the guy's throwing 90. Yeah. It's just night and day difference. So hopefully it does happen and hopefully That'd we're here awesome. to cover it. Yeah, that would be great. It's time for our uh, viewer question. And just a reminder, you can always send in your viewer questions to you. Hashtag the shoot bosses, whether you want to put that on our Facebook, Instagram, X, Twitter, TikTok, you name it. We'll try and get your question answered. And this one's going to come from Jonathan on Facebook, Tracy. They want to know how many Cowboys have won world championships in four different events or categories. So I was kind of confused but he meant by categories but I was thinking you know he probably doesn't consider the all around an event mm-hmm. when you if that was what I had to guess and right. you know we start that list at the very top guys like Everett Bowman yeah. how about only three all time it's Everett Bowman Bill Linderman who the Linderman mm-hmm. award is named after now and then none other than you know one of the greatest Cowboys you've ever covered in Trevor Brazil yeah, I mean, it's, it's so hard to win four world championships. In and this isn't years. in a single year. This is just, like, over their entire career. And, and yeah. it's just so difficult. I mean, yeah. we talk about Stetson now, who wins all around Saddle Bronk and Bulls. Mm-hmm. But where would his fourth event be? Like, where, I, yeah, you've got to come up Trevor, with another Trevor one. Trevor was a great tie-down roper. He was a great team roper. He was going to win in the all-around, and he was an unbelievable steer roper. And so you have to be really good in multiple events, and then that ultimately probably leads to the all-around championship. But... Mm-hmm. I, it's just, it's crazy. I mean, it tells you how short that list is. Yeah, and, you know, we talk about can you win four in a year? Never been done. But at the same time, you know, on the, on the flip side of things, Trevor Brazil's a two-time Triple Crown winner, I think 2007, 2010. Mm-hmm. So, you know, how do you find that fourth event? Like a guy like Stetson, if he, you know, he's never won the Triple Crown yet. You know, he, he's, he had an opportunity I, last year had he not got hurt. Right. But how do you find, I, how do you win four events I think he'd have the most legitimate shot when he's healthy cause if he rode bareback. Yeah. And I know that's probably goes a, your a, neck. <laughs> probably a family decision that yeah. he probably won't ride bareback. But Ty Murray did, you know, yeah. he did all three. You know, he was doing bulls, saddle bronc, and bareback, and then he was winning all around. That's the shot. But then what are you doing to your body at that point? <laughs> I mean, riding bulls and saddle bronc is tough enough. And then if you add bareback, and then at the end of our level, I mean, it, that's a tough ask of any cowboy. And time to event guys could do it maybe if – they figured out how to ride rough stock, but that's just usually not what those guys do. Well, and I think, you know, you talked about Trevor being able to do it in four events. I think, you know, one of the reasons he was Tracy is because steer roping wasn't the same time as the NFR. Right. So at the most, he was going to have two events in Las right. Vegas. You know, if Stetson was to try and do it, he would, if he was to make it in bareback, he would have to, you know, have three events in Las Vegas. So, you know, it does have to, you have to find that fine line and, you know, it's just such a difficult feat. You know, we mentioned how many years has Pro Rodeo been going, you know, right. and we've had three ever. And, and like Shad Mayfield, obviously maybe a candidate because if he learns how to steer rope, like yeah. not learn, but obviously he can do it. But Well, then he's got to win but, another but, event. But, but then you'd have, then he could move to team roping because yeah. that's a logical move for a lot of tie down guys is they go to team roping. Yeah. But then you're asking that guy, I'm going to move and then I'm going to be a world champion. I mean, we saw with like Tim Farr, he was a tie down, you know, couple time NFR tie down guy took him like five years just to feel like he's comfortable in steer roping because steer roping so competitive that's the thing is you can do other events but it's like being a golfer like you're translating and then you're trying to win a world championship against the best of the best yeah in all four events so it's definitely a special feat we appreciate that question from Jonathan on our Facebook and uh, a guy that has a lot of questions in life and you know he might submit a couple to the shoe bosses one of these times is Buck and uh, I saw him Tracy he was combing his hair he's you know he's starting to look like he's maybe turning things around ever since he took that nap down in the hall of fame a couple shows ago yeah i, I like i like the shirt i'm seeing him wear I, I saw him walking around campus here i call it a campus it's headquarters looking nice looking slick that's not the word of the day but he looks he looks like he's trying to turn over a new leaf he's trying to be a better buck <laughs> we'll see if he can accomplish that here's buck he's got your pro radio word of the day
I'm Buck, official correspondent for the Shoe Bosses, the official podcast of the PRCA. My word for the day is style. As in cowboys copy other cowboys style, like someone may copy Casey Fields style as a bareback rider. When it comes to Buck, this is style. This is style. My future's so bright, I gotta wear shades. Beware, ladies. I'm out and about. Cowboying is in our blood. Cowboying is in our bruises. It's in our rain-soaked jackets. In our calloused hands, tested by barbed wire and rope. Our mud-stained boots to the crown of our resist all hat. You live out west for even the shortest time, and there's one thing you learn. You can't pretend out here. Resist all. We live it every day. Welcome back into the Shoot Bosses podcast, the official podcast of Pro Rodeo and Tracy. We talked about it off the top. We're getting ready to sit down with Ty Harris, and man, what a whirlwind of a month of March it's been for Ty Harris. You know, finding a way to win Rodeo Houston, going up against his brother in a tiebreaker, and you know, he's he's setting himself up for a really good spring and summer run here. Oh, definitely. I mean, Houston, obviously the highlight of a lifetime for a cowboy to win that and to win it with a family member and a tiebreaker. I mean, th- that's a legendary performance right there. Yeah, now Ty's going to be joining us right here on the Shoot Bosses podcast. Ty, we appreciate your time. We know you got a little break in the action, maybe went on a vacation or something like that, but uh, we appreciate you taking a couple minutes to talk to us, man. Yes, sir, man. Thanks a lot for having me. I uh, got to sneak on down here to Tampa, Florida for a few days with the family and had to, uh, had to go to a roping clinic in Oregon right now with Brad Goodrich, so thanks for having me. Yeah, first thing we got to ask you is we'll talk about the most recent accomplishment for you. Obviously, winning Rodeo Houston, you know, that's one of those rodeos that any cowboy in the world would circle and say, you know, that's that's a rodeo that I want to find a way to win. Take us through that last, uh, you know, championship Sunday, you know, ultimately the tiebreaker with your brother and walking away with that $50,000 check. Yes, yeah, sir. I mean, uh both kind of just made okay runs in the 10 man round, you know, uh, had some guys, some guys had some bad things happen and we, uh, we, we got through there barely. And then, you know, we were just so happy to be there. I think we both just took the pressure off and said, let's go have fun. You know, we're back to back. It's kind of, you know, we're riding the same horse. Um, we, we just so happened to be riding the same stirrups, the same rope. And they, we didn't, they didn't want to get a split. We had talked about it previously. Whenever we had made the short round, so I'm gonna split you guys. Then the four man to make it. If both of you guys make it, you know, probably won't happen. But if you do, we can't split that, you know, because it'd be too much of an advantage to get to go at the end. So we knew that if we were just so happy to be next, day, I mean, I was so freaking excited for him and so pumped, and that it, it just—I've never felt like that before my run because I was—it was like I'd already won. You know, I knew that that was gonna at no with Marty Yates and and Chance Lee and two great ropers behind us. I knew no worse he won second or third. Second or third, I knew it was a big. Big run for him, no matter no matter what. He he succeeded and he did a good job at, at a high pressure situation that he's been wanting to do for a while. It's kind of was a big breakthrough for him. So whenever I backed in there, it just felt like I had a I had a I just had a lot of stress taken off, a lot of weight off my shoulders. And then so to see that clock, to hear the crowd and to see his face and to see the clock sitting on eight two when we tied, man, that was just it was an amazing moment that I'll never forget. I, I, there's no clock whenever you throw your hands up and you're going back to get on, you can't see the time, but I could just see his face. And I knew that it was either right by him, right in front of him or tied. And so whenever I got back on and then saw the eight, two men, I can't explain the emotions. What It was just, I'll never forget it for sure. So then you go into the, the tiebreaker round with them. What, what was the mindset then? And how, what, what can you say about the horse? I mean, the horse has to run those runs as well. And you're both sharing the same horse. Six runs in a row for him to do that is just, it's amazing. That horse, uh, it took a while. He kind of just, he wanted to be a little fidgety in the box and stuff. And so we never knew if he would be able to do three or four runs or even six, or six runs in a row in a day and, and stay that good. And for him to give us a chance every single time, man, I can't say enough about how, how amazing that animal is and how much he means to us. That uh, that horse has been a life changer. His name's Mo. We actually got him from Justin Moss when I was I was living down there working for Justin and and got to got the opportunity to buy him and man what a what a what a deal because we've had him for so long we never we just it, we never thought that was gonna that was gonna come of that horse but for him to do that six times in a row for us we're very thankful 
You know, obviously, you know, it's something that's special with you traveling down, competing against your brother. Take us through a little bit about what it's just like traveling with family. You know, I believe your cousin Cole's been in the rig with you guys here some, uh, put out some great content. You know, what's that been like to kind of make it a family affair and have all you guys, you know, kind of shooting for that same goal? Man, it's been rejuvenating for me. Uh, you know, seventh year rodeo, and I, I still feel like a rookie, man. Whenever I get in the truck with those guys and we show up to the rodeo, I'm just – I'm more excited than I've ever been. Uh, so that's pretty cool. You know, a lot of t times I think you can kind of – the road can wear you down and stuff. But, man, I just – I'm so excited that every rodeo we get to go to together and, and every memory we get to make. Oh, last year was kind of long for him. And, you know, and th he didn't he didn't perform the way he wanted to. But it, uh, it still was an amazing year just in the fact that we got to experience all that together. And with his new wife being on the road, we just – it's awesome family memories, and I'll never forget it for sure. So last year you had a great regular season. You won Cowboy Christmas. You set Cowboy Christmas records. I'm imagining you felt like you didn't have the NFR you wanted to. How do you get to that gold buckle? I mean, you know how this works. I mean, Vegas, if you do well in Vegas, you got a chance to win the gold buckle because there's so much money there now. Yes, sir. I just um, – my, my goal is prepare as best I can and be, and be ready to go execute mentally, physically, my horse, every everything that I can do to prepare and then – and then go execute and then see where I end up. I've never ex I, I, our, our big game plan when we practice and when I go to the rodeos is for me to prepare and then execute to the best of my ability. And usually I like where I end up. I, I've, I've, I like my results whenever I feel like I can do my job the best of my ability. And I'm not saying there's not there's the best guys in the world and I'm going to get beat some, but over a long period of time, if I can do the best the best of my ability, I'm going to I'm going to like the results and where it ends up. So that's what I want to do from now until the rest of the year and then and hopefully feed it in the next year. I, I just one day at a time being the best I can be, and we'll see where it is in December. What's it like being from what people call the calf roping capital of the world, you know, down in San Angelo, Texas? You know, that's one of those counties and one of those cities that, you know, it is just loved by fans. You feel it. You're from there. You know, when you rope there, it's they always love the calf roping. What's that like for you, Ty? Man, it's, uh, it's amazing because you go to a lot of rodeos where it's just another event, you know, and, and whatever, and people might be going to get their – get their get their beer or get their hot dog you know but in san angelo everybody's sitting down to watch the cafe open and it's amazing from the fiesta to the rodeo everything people don't come to san angelo rodeo for a concert they come to watch the rodeo and cafe open is a big part of that so to be from there and to feel what the crowd does and boy paul hemus when he gets it rolling in there i mean i look i look for i was right after i won houston you know and and that kind of hit me i was like man i can't wait to open angelo you know like boyd was announcing at houston he's going to be there in angelo and to feel what that crowd has done and to see all the posts and messages and all the things from my local local fans and local friends and family and everybody. I just it's so awesome to get to come home and man, I can't wait. Who's one of your maybe role models or people you like even your brother as well, like you patterned yourself out. I obviously I'm sure you knew you were gonna do this at a young age or, you know, felt like you had the opportunity. Who are some ropers you looked out to? Man, um, you know, you obviously look up to Trevor Brazil, Cody Ole growing up, Fred Whitfield, Joe Beaver, uh, uh, somebody that I, Justin Moss, some somebody that I started um, trying to mold myself a little bit after with Shane Hanchy when I started rodeo, and I loved the fact that he was never beat. Shane, it wasn't over till Shane rope no matter what, especially in an average rodeo. It didn't matter if he hadn't won nothing in 15 rodeos. You knew if he was going to run a good calf, he's probably going to win something. And he doesn't mess up very much. He's always the same. It doesn't matter if he's winning or losing. He's just, he's like that, even keel. And so that's somebody – when I got to, got to start rodeoing, and he actually helped me. He kind of took me in and mentored me in a lot of ways, like just keeping me even keel. I mean, we know I can get a little bit excited, and I'll also get a little bit frustrated with myself if it doesn't go good. But, man, he does a great job of just staying the same. You don't make 14 straight NFRs and be a world champion. And, I mean, he's not the biggest guy. He's always had to have amazing fundamentals. And so he's a, he's a great athlete. But, man, to do what he does on no matter what the setup, the situation, Cavs, he's somebody that I tried to mold myself after on the mentality of rodeoing and winning and staying the same to make the, I, I want to make as many consecutive NFRs as I can. That's, that's, that's my goal. And so obviously the guy that's done it 14 times straight, I try to try to take some stuff from him for sure. So let's make you think off the, the top of your head here. What's uh what's the best uh, travel story you guys got in the rig? You got any good ones that can be shared here on the show? <laughs> Man. Um, this year we were headed, we were trying to fly to Williams Lake, British Columbia, and we get stopped up there at the, at the border and i mean they're not letting us up not letting us through they like our charter didn't have i guess the right uh the right signal or something anyways our pilot ended up being a rookie we got we got a new rookie pilot it was just rough deal little bitty four-seater plane 
it's me, Haven, Major, Zach, Youngblood, and my brother. And it was, <laughs> let's just say it was an interesting trip. It was pretty, pretty rough, pretty small plane. And then we ended up making it. We literally jumped in. We land. Clay Elliott and his girlfriend are waiting. They pick us up. They had drove our horses from Alberta to British Columbia. So they're waiting for us. We jump. They Three guys jump in the truck. I jump in the back. I literally ride in the bed through town from the airport to the Williams Lake Rodeo. We get there. They're doing the national anthem. It's barrel racing, 10 barrel racers, calf road. They got my horse saddled, whatever. We were open. And then we're like, after we get done, we're like, oh, where are we going to stay? Start looking up rooms. I mean, it's a desolate place over there in British Columbia. Beautiful, but it's desolate. There's not a hotel not in, within 100 miles that has a room. We're flying. We can't fly out to the next morning because this little plane this and this pilot, they got to get this many hours of rest or whatever. We're headed back to St. Paul. And we, so we end up just going to this hotel and just begging them for a room, begging them. And we we're like, there's not even that many cars in the parking lot. We know you got a room, you know, how many times you've been to a hotel and you're like, you know, we know you're not booked up. And so we know, anyways, we all end up us four. And then Benny Mosley somehow jumps in with us. I don't know if you know Benny, but he's a character. So he jumps in with us, goes up to this hotel. We're sleeping in the lobby. The lobby ain't no bigger than that off that, that room. You're sitting in right there. And we end up just laying across the chairs in the lobby. I sleep outside on the park bench. I was too embarrassed to stay in the lobby. I sleep outside on the park bench. And people are coming in, checking in, everything. About two hours later, I, uh, Brandon comes and wakes me up. He goes, we got a room. They they got so tired of us just being there, they ended up giving us rooms. <laughs> That's proof that hotels, a lot of times when they say they're booked up, they're not. Because we ended up getting in a room. We just annoyed them so bad. <laughs> I was so embarrassed I couldn't even be inside, but we ended up getting a room, and I ended up sleeping on the floor on that one too. I don't know how that worked, but nice, man. man, you have to see a chiropractor after that. You're tied down rope for yeah. sleep, sleeping like that. Hey, That's I'll kinda... tell you what. I tell you what. I think a hard flat surface is honestly better. It's not near as comfortable, but you, you, it's better than getting one of them soft beds. You sink in and put all that pressure on your discs. But anyways. <laughs> Well, it's great. It's been great talking to you. What, what, what's the ultimate? I mean, I know winning the gold buckle is the ultimate goal, but how, how exciting? Can you explain to people what like the grand entry and competing at the NFR is for you? Just being part of the Thomas McMack experience. Every time that you get to get to go down that alley, it's a blessing. I mean, every a young cowboy's dream or well, a cowgirl's dream to if they when they start riding a horse and, and really seriously getting into rodeo, uh, your dream is to make the NFR and to go down that tunnel. So. Every time we get to it, it's an honor, and I, I, uh, I definitely haven't taken it for granted. Um, 40, 40 times down the Thomas and Mack and those 10 in Arlington have meant the world to me, but I definitely want to take my career to the next level and try to, uh, try to be more successful and win more. So it's been amazing, and I want to enjoy every minute, but uh, I, I want to do better when I get there for sure. Well, Ty, we really appreciate it, man. We know you got a flight to catch. you got to get on the road. <laughs> yes, but, <laughs> yeah, we appreciate you. Hopefully you didn't miss your flight. They're calling me last last call right now. I better go get on. Have a good All one, right, Thank man. you. We appreciate it, Ty. Thanks, Ty. See ya. There it is, Tracy, Ty Harris. And uh, just awesome for him to take time out of his day to talk to us. And, you know, that just proves, like he said, you know, how much of a, a family effort it is going down the road for these guys. He's got his brother there, you know, his cousin Cole there kind of documenting it all for him. And, uh, you know, the goal is that gold buckle. Yeah, I mean, that's the life of a cowboy, though. What you see in the airport and mm -hmm. last call and getting on flights and – I mean, the coolest part I see outside of Ty is such a great roper, and he's got gold buckle potential, there's no doubt, is the fact that his cousin's documenting it. Because then you could go back and show your relatives and family, and you've got all that right there. And I mean, it would just mean, it'd be like watching old family movies. And that, that would make it even cooler to me, because I know I'm like an historian, and I love just going and watching stuff and be able to watch your, yourself and your brother and your cousin, that would be really cool to me. Yeah, no doubt about it. And it's something that, uh, you know, you can never count out Ty because he's got some of the quickest hands we've ever seen. You know, he's going to be a guy that's going to be in that world title hunt for quite a while. Well, he broke the Cowboy Christmas record yeah. last year. He won like, what, forty forty five thousand dollars $45,000 almost yeah. during Cowboy Christmas. And I, I shouldn't say bad NFR, but for those guys, it's a bad NFR. When you're that good, and ultimately with Vegas, and you and I have had this conversation umpteen times, is Whoever does the best in Vegas now wins. Yeah. It wins the world title because there's so much money in the average. There's so much money on a nightly basis. So if you get in a slump or you draw bad, I mean, things can change in a heartbeat. Hopefully that's not the case for him this year. And I'm excited to see him in San Angelo. I mean, you've been to the Foster Coliseum. Yeah, oh, yeah. It's like a little baby Denver Coliseum or they're real similar. They but when they say, but they, when they say San Angelo's own Ty Harris, 
I mean, that place goes ballistic. Yeah, it does. So it should be interesting to watch. We appreciate Ty jumping on. That's going to do it for another episode of The Shoot Bosses. We appreciate all of you. You can catch us on all of your favorite podcast platforms or on the PRCA YouTube page, and we will have much more great rodeo coverage coming your way. But until then, keep on rodeoing.